What's up, everybody? It's your girl, Michelle Renee from IamMichelleRenee.com, and I have um, one of my favorite people in the world with me today. And I say that for a lot of reasons, um, but today I want to introduce you to um, a young lady who truly is a picture of fortitude. Introduce yourself, sis. Hi guys, I am Natoya Sanders, uh, currently living in Starville, Mississippi, working at Mississippi State University, and just super glad to be here to have this conversation. Absolutely, thank you so much, Natoya. Um, I asked you the question a while ago, what does Black Girl Magic mean to you? Can you kind of like sum up what that means to you? Yeah, so I think I may have like told you one thing and now I'm thinking another, which is still the pretty much the same basis. Um, but prior to this, we had a little conversation and I was thinking, you know, so many times black women are labeled as strong because of things that they have overcome. And so a lot of times when we think about the term black girl magic, it's tied to that. You yeah. know, well, they're strong because they've done this. Well, they're, you know, they're magical because they've done this. And I'm like, I guess in, in my head, it's more so it's that too. But it's just the entire beauty of just being a black woman. You know, a lot of times we we are the glue, I feel like, that holds everything together. And while that does get, you know, exhausting, I just, I look at us and I'm like, man, we are super creative. You know, we are just innovative, you know, just so smart. And we don't always get, we don't always get that. We don't always get the accolades, you know, that we deserve. And I'm like, man, we truly are magical. Like we have it all and we can do it all. And that's literally what the phrase means to me. And you know what's funny about that? We are definitely magical, but I remember, I can't remember exactly who said it. It said, but the quote was, just because we're magical doesn't mean that we don't hurt. Yes. Jesse. Um, Jesse Williams? Williams? Yes. 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 That was it. That was just it. because we're magical doesn't mean that we don't hurt. We don't experience pain. We don't, you know, go through things yes. that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think about that, and then I think about, um, just some ways we're able to harness that. So if you would not mind sharing and only share what you're comfortable with sharing, sure. can you give us a little, a little bit of your story and why I would view you as a survivor? Okay, so yeah, um, I guess, let's see, what year is this? This is 2020, oh Lord. So t February, 2016. Oh, it's been the longest year ever. It's been like a whole oh, decade of years. It's been like five years in one. <laughs> So um, I'll condense it as much as possible. So February 22nd, 2016, my husband and I had a son, uh, Jordan. Jordan weighed one pound, one ounce. Uh, he came into this world at 25 weeks. Um, he lived in the NICU at UMC down in Jackson for eight months. And so, um, you know, just battling different issues that were related to prematurity. Uh, Jordan passed away on October 30th of 2016 and so you know honestly people think those eight months you know were our journey no the journey started after um yeah that was a true kind of finding yourself and really figuring out like what is my purpose here like how do I go forward um I was getting ready to turn turn 30 so I always kind of I just try to find the humor in life and I'm like, okay, this was my midlife crisis. Like I quit my job of five years. I started working at a coffee shop, like, you know, really just, um, but I had to take away all of that, you know, when well, you're doing this at, at this point in your life, at this age, yada, yada, this is where you should be. And just be like, you know what? None of that matters because my life has already been flipped upside down. So yeah. why not do what makes you happy? And I always, literally, it was a joke. I always said that if I ever, I mean, it was a joke, but it was a serious joke. But I always said, you know, Joey, if I ever stop working, like, I want to work at a coffee shop because I believe that's what will make me happy. Well, 30 years old, I was at a coffee shop and it's truly what made me happy. Um, so, fast forward a little bit and I ended up, <laughs> I actually got another job on campus. So, the time that I went back to campus a few months later, uh, we found out we were expecting. And so, um, again, so we were going through that process. And in January of that year, we found out that uh, at 20 weeks, our baby girl, uh, Journey, she didn't have a heartbeat. And so there we go again, you know, and it's like this entire time I was thinking, 
okay, God, this is it. Like, you know, we, we started this new journey and, you know, you're giving us beauty for ashes. And then we go into literally a routine appointment and bam. And I'm like, so we have to go through this all over again, you know? <laughs> so it's kind of, and I, I won't really say starting over that healing process because it just kind of blended into one, you know? Um, and that was, that was hard. Um, I really didn't talk about that much. Um, I talk about Jordan all the time. I did not talk about the experience with Journey a lot just because it, it was a different type of hurt. You know, I was there every single day with Jordan for eight months. With right. Journey, she was inside of my stomach for 20 weeks. So we didn't have that, you know, we had the mother-daughter bond, but I never got to actually see her outside of the womb and spend spend time with her outside of the womb. And I honestly see, I was telling my sister one day, I see why women don't talk about miscarriage. Right. Because it, it's just a, it's a different type of pain. And it's almost a pain that you don't know how to describe to people because it's like, I didn't have my hands on that child, you know? And I, I, I find that when you try to explain it to people, if they've never experienced it, they sometimes minimize it. Yes. And it's a real loss. Mm -hmm. And that, but, that's another thing, like, so, and, and, you know, I fast forward from there until now, you know, um, and again, still just kind of going through, you know, that process, but you know, in since 2016 experienced the loss of two children, you know, I'm like, I don't know, you know, and then 2020 comes and we in the middle of a pandemic. So I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? You know, am I not listening? But um, people do, they, they, and I have found that people mean well, but they people do. just really do not know what to say. Because even after losing Jordan, I have found myself saying, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And I'm like, yes, you do. You know, you know that you don't have to say anything. You just be there, mm -hmm. you know, or you know that, I mean, still now, some of my friends will just send me a heart and I know that means that they're thinking about me. Mm -hmm. They don't have to say anything else, you know, and that gives me a, a piece of a, a sense of comfort, you know, just knowing, wow, like it's, it's nothing better than knowing that you're in somebody's prayers that you didn't ask for, Listen, you know, all and the time. Every time I open up my cupboard, I have his um, super Jordan. Uh, Yes. <laughs> and I look at that and then the other because that was one of the other things that you had it was a venture with sweet honey yep sweet honey mm -hmm. and all these beautiful coffee cups with these amazing sayings and I, I, I ordered as many of them as I could yes, you did. <laughs> I looked at it and I'm like you know we we have to find a way to almost like channel that energy when you're yeah. hurting yeah and you find things that that bring joy to you as much as they can for that moment. I can remember very vividly, um, I think it was earlier this year, where you shared a memory of Jordan and then you almost, you didn't, you almost prefaced it with an apology for still sharing. Mm -hmm. And I can remember Adam Lee saying, don't you ever apologize for sharing one of the most precious things and precious gifts that you've been given. Because you don't even know how much that gift and you sharing him with us does for us. Yeah. And I think that's kind of one of the most amazing, like, you know, I have to get out of my head a lot because I'm like, at what point are you transparent to help someone? And at what point are you just sharing too much because it's social media, you know? Um, and every time I get to that point, literally something happens, whether it be um, an opportunity at the hospital or it being like just literally someone randomly, you know, saying, and, the, and it may not even be tied to someone with loss. It just may be tied to just, you know, someone in general. And they'll say, you have no idea how much, you know, Jordan's story impacted my life. And I'm like, okay, God, well, that's, that's what I was asking you. And you gave me that. And so, you know, I have to tell myself, I, I think it all depends on your angle. Absolutely. You know, and I have to tell myself, okay, I know for a fact that, that I'm sharing to educate, you know, and also I'm sharing to brag about my baby at times. <laughs> adorable. Like, that was... Y'all share y'all's pictures of y'all baby, so I'm going to share mine too. That's right. And some of the coos and the smiles and those little toes and those little lips. Oh, I didn't love You see it and you're just like, you're, you're taken aback and um, just to even immortalize the stories of, of what he would be doing. Like... Yes. these are your memories and I think it's important that 
if you're going to be able to survive a traumatic experience, you have to be able to survive it in a way that is most comfortable and healthiest for you. And we have to empower one another to be able to do that. That's true, because a lot of times it's, it's so much silence around it, you know, and, and we expect people to just move on um, or, you know, we're, we're, I say we, because as a society, we're really good at, well, you know, my grandmother had, you know, three miscarriages before she had a baby or this and that happened. And I'm like, well, first of all, who wants to do that? Like, that's not normal. No one just wants to go through these traumatic experiences. Right. And we try to normalize it, right? Well, you right. know, so I'm going, whoa, whoa. Like, oh, that, you know, thanks a lot for making me feel better, you know? And like I said, I, I think people try but in order to make them feel more comfortable with your with your loss then they have to minimize it for them because it's so much and like so many times people will say I really cannot imagine what it's like to lose a child and I say please don't like that's not doing me any good and that's not doing it's really not doing you any good to to give yourself those thoughts about you losing a child because I never did you know so tell me after Jordan passed well you know I know, you know, you probably knew it was coming, but it didn't make any easier. And I said, no. Absolutely not. That that was never a thought. That was literally never. I don't care if Jordan had spent three years in the hospital. I I don't, I did not go day to day thinking that my baby wouldn't come home to me. Right. Like I, that was not, and, and, and that would get into a whole nother spiel, you know, as to kind of how the NICU is. It's literally a roller coaster, but no, that, that wasn't, you know, the, 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 the thought process um, at all. I get it. And I, I think that you just really captured that thought. I don't want you to experience what that feels like. Like people often think that you are desiring sympathy. And it's like, no, I don't want you to. I tell people the hurts that I've experienced in life, I don't want anybody to feel that way. Exactly. That's <laughs> my thing. Like literally after we lost Jordan, like I told Joey, like I never want a parent to feel that pain and I know that I can't stop it so now my goal per se going forward is to be able to walk alongside a parent because I, I know that I don't have the power power to stop it right, you know? right. Um, but I can do a small part in saying okay you have experienced this now let's see how we're gonna get through it and it's not an overnight thing I don't have any magical answers or anything um, right. my number one response is that it's hard and it's going to be hard. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's going to be okay because that's not the case. And that's not what you want to hear. Absolutely. So once we get that out of the way, then we can figure out how to. And you can develop a plan for how to manage certain aspects, right? Um, and you can speak to, okay, so I know that when you go through this, this is how I responded. Mm -hmm. And this may be something that you consider, whether it's journaling or saying, you know, I just want to scream sometimes. Scream. Right. right? And a lot of it feels good just to know that like your feelings are validated and I think that's with anything in life but specifically like from some of the things that I've gone through like I've talked to parents that I, I remember specifically talking to a parent that lost a child unrelated like not prematurity or anything um but she was two and one day I had this weird feeling and I was like, okay, everybody's going to be like, she's nuts, you know? And I'm like, of course I wouldn't publicly say these things because I don't feel like anybody would get it. And in casual conversation, she told me my exact feelings and I was like, oh my gosh. And I was like, okay, so I'm not weird. And she's like, no, I feel like that all the time. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's just this big, because you can get in your head. Absolutely. About a lot of things. Oh, about a lot of things for yourself. I think that having conversations and normalizing the conversations is what's critical because a lot of times we, um, especially as black women, because of that whole strong black woman thing, mm -hmm. we sweep things under the rug or right. we allow traumatic experiences to um, build this shield. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, oh yeah, this happened to me and now I do this. And so it's whatever. And I'm like, and that's right, not helpful. Not unpack that. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's like you just carrying that on and on. And I had to realize that myself because my sister did. Um, I, I remember she did um, the one of the first uh, documentary screenings. Mm -hmm. And pause one second. Her sister is the Dr. Nikita <laughs> first, who we interviewed in a while a while ago. And the documentary is Laboring with Hope. Yes, because I did talk about you in that article. 
Oh, yeah. So she did, um, you know, and I went down because she was having a panel discussion after it. So it was the first one that was going to be done to the public. And, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm cool. I got this, yada, yada. Girl, oh, my gosh. I don't think I've ever been that sick in my life. Like, well, I have probably. But, like, during the panel, it's like I was doing everything I could, like, just not to just, like, throw up up there. My head was pounding. It was just horrible. And after it was over, like, I just remember running to the bathroom. And I was like, why am I so sick? And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm never nervous talking about Jordan. But I realized that was one of the very first times that I even mentioned journey and our miscarriage. And I guess it was just so many emotions, you know, around it that, it just made me phys yeah, it made me physically ill. And I'm like, you know, that's not healthy. That's not healthy. So whatever steps that I need to take, and it doesn't mean that I have to go to Facebook. It doesn't mean that I have to talk to anybody. It means that I can pull my journal out if that's my best way to get my feelings out. But I had to process some of the things and some of the, you know, guilt is is guilt will take you down through there. Oh yes. And I had to oh, I mean God and lots of therapy you know with Jordan and Journey I finally come to a place where you know I can say and mean it that God's will was going to be done one way or the other right and I don't care about your fault you didn't do anything if yeah I that day versus a right you know um it was going to happen because I believe that all of our lives are predestined God God already has the the you know our our plan laid out he knows exactly what's going to happen and he's given us the tools and the people to get us through that. And that's one of the major things that has helped me be able to keep going is because I know, you know, it wasn't your fault. That's it right. wasn't, it wasn't your fault, you know, and that's, it's major, but it just helped me. I'm so proud of the work that you, that you do. Um, one with, of course, supporting your sister and developing the documentary. So sharing your story on that platform, because that's a lot. Um, but also you do um, work hand in hand with Larry Baston and the NICU to support families. Can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do? Yeah, sure. So um, like I said, Jordan passed in October 2016 and I think I was just on this rush. So by like December, I was emailing them and even we always had a really great relationship, you know, while they're like they attended Jordan's funeral. And I mean, just they love my baby. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, I was just laying here and thinking, you know, what ways to give back and I think that was also in part of my grief and so I had emailed the medical director you know about some of my ideas and she said all of these ideas are great but I want you to pause and I want you to grieve and make sure that you're in a good space and I thought I was and I wasn't I'm like oh this just happened like two months ago you know which is really like two minutes ago so fast forward to when I'd actually got in a better space um and you know we literally went back and forth with some ideas and we created um, what's called Impasse and it's a NICU family advisory um, and support board. And so it's composed of like a few parents, um, the medical director, um, the chief of the NICU, as well as like nursing staff and basically just that, like being a support for parents. So uh, one of the things that we do is a newsletter so we do a newsletter for, you know, the parents in the NICU just with different information, um, you know, because you're, I mean, your bedside, first of all, there's a lot of terms. It's just so much going on, you know. Yeah, with it's a lot to try to process, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of one thing just to get their mind off of it, you know, and give some little information. Um, but we also do, so like we host monthly meetings and if there's a parent, so say sometimes I've been called and said, well, there's a parent that, you know, is having a little hard, a hard time or such, can you mentor them? So we do that. Um, if we know that there are parents like, you know, a lot of times there are babies from New Orleans that are in this NICU, you know, because it's the closest level four NICU to them. So, you know, doing small things to make sure that the families have what they need, you know, mm -hmm. while they're here trying to take care of their children, or even if it's just like gas cars, because them going back and forth, you know, just small things like that um, to be of assistance to the parents. And so um, basically, like I said, that's, that's what it is, is being a support um, for the parents because I noticed while the medical staff was supportive for me I didn't have anybody else besides my family now I don't mean that that I didn't have you know support from family and friends but like 
you know, you're in this hospital and like the friends that I made, I made them in the pumping room, you know, or the lactation room, I guess I should say. And, you know, while literally they are like my girls that, you know, I talk to all the time, but we were all going through that together, you know, and there wasn't someone that said like, you know, hey, well, I walked through the NICU and, you know, X, Y, and Z, or I should say that there were times where I had conversations with people that maybe have had preemies, but it's like oftentimes I felt like they were, it, I couldn't relate it to our situation, right. you know, and they may have been three pound preemies that, and nothing wrong with that, but you know, three pound preemies that maybe were on no oxygen requirements and they had to feed and grow and go home. Right. You know, or it may have, it, and I just could, you know, it's, it's hard to relate to that because I'm like, oh, this isn't our experience at all. And now I know that that's okay. You still need, you know, that support. But um, those are people like, you know, maybe back at home or people that other people had connected me to. So I just thought that it would be good to kind of have that there, you know, at the hospital. Because I mean, there are days I would just walk down to the playground. And I'm like, okay, I can't do this, you know, and I wish I had somebody right here that I could talk to. That, so, can, that can relate on some level, right? Yeah. Yes, and so um, that's what we did, like I said, form, form that uh, family advisory board. So I'm excited because we are, I say we, they are building a, a new tower for the NICU. So the plans, um, when they first started with the plans, we got to go down and look at that and pick out all the artwork, so on and so forth, look at the rooms. And now it's like, it's finally here. So um, due to some delays with COVID, the babies were supposed to move in um, in October. So there will be some little delays, but the babies will be moving in and transferring soon. So I really think it's going to be a game changer um, because in the NICU that we were in, you know, UMC is the largest, it's the only level four NICU. Mm -hmm. So even if a baby is at River Oaks and they have to have a surgery, they're going to be transferred to NICU. Absolutely. And you know, that's good and sometimes it's bad because that means that you're in this huge NICU with several other babies and there's no private rooms. So again, there's a lot of trauma that goes along with losing your own child, but there's a lot of trauma that I don't even talk about that goes with seeing other children that are have to pass on. And that's something that I don't, I don't know. I don't think an amount of therapy can help me get through that. I'm not sure yet. Um, I don't, I don't think it will because that's something that, you know, you live with forever. And yeah. I tell people when it comes to trauma, you can go to therapy. Therapy is designed to help you unpack it, right. process it, and kind of understand what you're going to do with it. And sometimes in that understanding is realizing that, you know what? I am going to have that forever, even right. if it's a memory or even if it's some piece of something, mm -hmm. it's going to be there. And it's teaching you how to deal with the fact that it is going to be there. Right. right. But right. to see that um, in the midst of heart and, and tragedy, to still be able to go and have a desire to ensure that families to some degree don't experience it in the same way. Yeah. or that have a support system is truly, that's what Black Girl Magic is. That's what we do. Well, thank you. We take it's care just, of people. Well, it's right, and it's, but it's, it's so, I remember, like, my family being so nervous, you know, with, well, are you going back? Is that going to, you know, kind of interrupt your healing? Yeah. And I said, I know it sounds weird, but this is part of my healing, Absolutely. you know, and, like, walking those halls, literally, I mean, my baby never left those walls, and I feel closest to him when I'm there. And so, you know, it's like all of the work, like, you know, of course I, I enjoy my job and I love my students, but, and I, I don't get paid for any work that I do at the hospital, but I'm like, that's my work, you know, that's my passion. And I know what that truly means now to find, I'm like, I found my passion, you know, it stemmed from a loss. Like it stemmed from this horrible experience or this traumatic experience. I wouldn't say, I shouldn't say horrible because literally I would redo those eight months. If, Listen, you know, because that. that was the most beautiful eight months, right? Yeah, it was, it was. And, and it's crazy how, you know, a lot of times you think, okay, your passion is something that you grow up with. You've always seen, you wanted to do this. And I'm like, wow, my passion was birthed from this, you know, traumatic experience. And it's still not done yet, you know, still adding on to that. Um, but I, I think that, you know, God just constantly reveals things in, wow, the craziest ways, you know, I may just be laying there and I'm like, that's what you want me to do about that situation, you know, but it always goes back to, 
you know, helping a family. And I don't, I don't know. I'm Jordan isn't at the NICU anymore. You know, I don't have a child there, but I want to ensure that every child that does go through there can have a, I don't want to say a good experience because, you know, you're in the hospital, but as pleasant as possible, you know, and especially with the parents. So we may do little footprints and, you know, things for holidays. I mean, those are my saving grace. I have all of those, you know, in the room in the scrapbooks, yes. <laughs> you know, it's those just the cutest little memories and different things. Um, it, it truly, it, it, I, I couldn't quite put my, my finger on it because I'm looking, you know, I had a nephew who was born in, um, born, born very early and was in the NICU and I'm going, hold on, he didn't get all that cool stuff. What was going yeah. on over here? Different hospital. I won't call yeah. him out. But, you know, I'm going, hmm, I know. Maybe you can get a little bigger, right? Yeah, and it's like, especially when, you know, because you're thinking, okay, when your kid, when you go back to work and your baby goes to daycare, they're bringing home little Mother's Day things. You know, they're bringing home little Christmas stuff and you're having to spend the holidays in a hospital with people that you don't know, you know? And so it's like, just to, that was literally the highlight. I'll never forget they asked me what I wanted for Mother's Day. And I said, to give my baby a bath. And they let me give him a bath. And that was the first time he could wear clothes. And I was just delighted, you know? So it's, I mean, when people say small things matter, small things really do matter because it may be small to you. Right. Literally but it's, um, it's immeasurable to somebody else yep. because what, what they gave you that day was a memory. Yes. And, and nobody can take it from you. Oh, yes. It's literally the best. I almost tear up talking about it because it's literally one of the best memories, you know, that, that I have of him. And he hated the bath. I mean, let me be real. He did not like it. He cried the entire time. But we liked it. And I'm like, okay, Jordan, so you just going to have to get through this, okay, because we having fun. <laughs> right. We're over here having a good time, sir. <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that's beautiful. And like I tell people, um, I actually talk about you a whole lot. No. And it is to describe how you can find passion through pain. Yeah. And that that passion can be driven driven to a whole different type of purpose because um I made the joke about the other NICU, um, but at the same time I see the work that you're doing having a much larger scale, right? Because you know, Jackson, Mississippi and Mississippi, we're not the only places or the only people who experience these losses, right? Yeah. So just thinking about, you know, ways that that can be expanded and how people, once they become educated or know um, what can happen and how things can transform. All you need is an idea and you go to them too. That's you know, right. that's literally all it started with an email, you know, and an email I did not know what I was doing. I don't have any, I'm not a healthcare person, you know, and I'm sure in heck not a counselor. So I have to say that, you know, up front, like I don't have any of this experience by my mom. Right. And my mom, mom. Was and as long as you got that, you can you can do whatever you want to do. And listen, we have a special kind of power. We do as moms, and I think it's actually activated before you ever have a kid or anything. I don't know what it is, but the moment that it happens and kicks in, it's like mm, it's this special power, right? No, that's it. That's like, it. That's it right there. <laughs> so. I, I think that what, what has been harnessed in you is so beautiful. And while it hurt as a friend and a soror to see you hurt, I can honestly say to see you as a Phoenix rising is such a joy to watch. Like I'm watching this journey and I'm going, my God, you are doing something amazing in my sister. <laughs> and it's truly a blessing to like really just know that you have this power that you're harnessing mm -hmm. and that you're not allowing it to to stifle you in a sense that you know when I say stifle I mean that to stop and halt all productivity right, right. that does not mean that you don't get to embrace the days when it's hard because right. you do yeah and there are days when it's hard and there are days you know because I have them too when you're like I'm not doing anything today. Yep, I can't do this. I just cannot. Yep. <laughs> and please don't talk to me because I'm not. <laughs> exactly. Right? I have a lot of those. <laughs> yep. And, but when you, when you come out of it, you come out of it so powerful. It's insane. And when you come out of it, 
what I've noticed about you, Natoya, is you come out of it with a vision. <laughs> I can always birth something. So I'm like, maybe this is an incubation period. Liz, maybe it is. Like, tell me something. Because sometimes I'm like, I don't know. What am I doing? <laughs> but exactly. I do think there's beauty in taking that time. Because we just get in this cycle of pushing ourselves and pushing ourselves. Because, oh, yeah. you know, well, this person did it. This person experienced loss and they kept going. You know, it motivated them. Like, okay, I don't care. I'm not them. At all. At the end of the day, like, I have... I have finally gotten to a place of some sort of peace to where I can say, you know, you know what? I, I'm learning to create my boundaries. I'm learning to protect my mental health and I'm learning to say no without an explanation. And that is hard. I'm it like, is, but no is a complete sentence. People that can just tell me no. I'm like, dang, how do you do that? Can you, can you tell me like your ways? Yes, it's hard. It's so hard because we get into this like routine of being a people pleaser. Absolutely. And I think that's just some of society's, you know, like expectations of us. And so it's, it's just so much joy in saying, you know what, I'm not going to be able to do that. Or even, even if it's like turning down projects, you know, no, that doesn't align with what I want to do, you know, and that being the end of it. No. And people are always, they sit there and look and they're waiting for your butt or and I'm like, it ain't no more. It's just a no, like, that's it. Yeah. And it's, it feels good, you know, when you, and I'm still learning, but it feels good when you can kind of get to that place. And, you know, there are days when I'll wake up and I'm like, I, I just cannot, like, today is just not a good day. Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? That's okay. Embrace that not so good day because tomorrow may be better. It may not, but five days from now will. And you, you can know? look back and say, I, hey, you know what? I survived it. That day I didn't think I would. Yep, and that's why I tell myself, like, because it's so easy to get into a cycle of grief because it gets, as weird as it sounds, it kind of gets comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, you can get comfortable just being in your grief and just laying there. And then I'm like, okay, so, hmm, you know, God, I like to think that I'm going to live for another 100 years. So is this how I want to live them? Yeah. You know, or how, how do I want to live them? Like, do I want to? I think that we are supposed to live a life of joy and that God wants us to have that joy. And so yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to live them. And sometimes that comes with guilt too, because you're like, are people going to look at me like, oh, well, she shouldn't be happy. Like she just buried her child, you know, or this or that happened. And I'm like, no, you don't get to dictate that. You do this not. Is my own journey. And here's the thing. You can be happy and live a happy life while also having sadness. Exactly. Because I'm like, you don't see those sad ones. You don't see those sad ones when I can't get out of bed. Yeah. So just because you, and I may talk about them, but you don't see them to the full extent, you know. So when I'm having these good days, let me have my good days. Yeah. Because I have some really, really, really low ones, you exactly. know. So I'm like, I'm not going to apologize for my good days. And nobody should. And absolutely and we shouldn't and that brings me to like a great um place of asking if you had to have a message or a word for other survivors of anything what would you say you can do it you can do it you know when sometimes when we're trapped in our journey or whatever we're going through you can barely see an end in sight you know and like i said i cannot tell you when it's going to be better um, when things are going to be a little brighter, but I just always tell myself like the sun is shining over there. And if I can just get over that little hump, like that's where I'm going to see it. And so, and like I said, I still don't know. Cause I feel like I got over that hump and saw the sun and then the clouds came again. Yeah. But guess what? The, the worst has happened now. So I'm like, let's go, you know? So just, it's, you can do it. No matter what it is, it may not be lost. You know, like you said, survivor comes in many different forms. But oh, if it's just one thing, just know, like, you know what? I can. And there's so much power, like, in telling yourself, you know what? I can do this. I can. Listen, I wholeheartedly believe that. So what's one thing that um, you'd like people to know about you? Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Let's see. Whatever I haven't told you, I talk too much for one. Um, but, um, you know, I'm just somebody figuring it out. Yeah. Like I, like I said, I don't have the answers. Um, gosh, I never expected this to be my journey at all. You know, I mean, I always wanted to be a wife and mom. Yes. You know, and, and so, but this is, this is me. This is my path. And, you know, I just hope that 
when people are watching this, you know, I guess the one thing they take from it is like life is very unpredictable, you know, but we can still get through it. One of my favorite shirts says making it up as I go. Girl, that's me. Literally every second of the day. Every (laughs) day I am making it up as I go because I don't have a clue what God has in store. All I ask, I pray in the morning. I say, God, whatever it is that you guys said, because you've been packing them pretty, pretty rough here lately. Um, Can you just make sure I survive it? I know. That's all I want. I mean, like this, sometimes I'm like, okay, can I get a little glimpse, like at least to know this is going to be better? But then I'm like, you know, because I know me and I know if he gave me that little glimpse, I'm going to run out. So right. He's he's gonna, to, I'm going to move around this. We're not, I'm gonna make sure this he's going to give you what you need, sis. You keep asking, but he's only going to give you what you need. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. So this is my final question. All right. What is one word that affirms who you are? Ooh. So someone told me this and I think I'm still going to steal it because it's weird to, it's resilient. I agree. Um, and that's weird saying that because a lot of times we feel weird patting ourselves on the back. It sounds like, Oh, I shouldn't call myself strong. I shouldn't call myself resilient, but you know what? I am. You are. I am. And And if if anybody can attest to it, it's you. (laughs) Right. And I'm like, you know, and we, we all are like, sometimes we may have to dig a little deeper than others. But um, resilient, I, I look back and some days I really wonder how. Yeah. Eight months in the hospital every day, you know, Joey had to come back to work. I stayed down there um, between the, you know, with, with family, with Ronald McDonald House, you know, just kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, and I'm like, how did you do it? And then getting up in the middle of the night to pump, but and then calling to check on him. And I'm like, because that's what we do. That's what mamas do, you know, but then I also tell myself, but then, you know, th- things have been different for, for other people and people deal with it differently and that's okay. But I thank God for the resilience to Absolutely. just be able to continue on and then to see things after, you know, like I said, just be able to kind of burst certain things after because I could still be stuck in that. I could really still be stuck in that. So when I say resilient, I know that strength doesn't come from me. That's you know, right. It comes from God. And I'm, oh, I'm so, I'm getting chill bumps because I'm so thankful. You know, when you have just gone through certain things and you really just don't feel like, you know, gosh, is this going to get better? Like, I just remember crying every single day. And I'm like, in no amount of tears, it's going to bring them back. Like, this hurts. How can I fix this hurt? Like a true heartbreak hurt. And there is no fix for it. But God. Girl, God. so he I think power to, to heal your heart, but it still doesn't take the hurt away. It doesn't take the hurt away, and that's okay though. And I tell people that doesn't make him any less God. That it doesn't. It does not. And and I have had my share of well, why didn't God heal my baby? I asked specifically to be healed on earth. I didn't say God heal him in heaven. Everybody said to be specific with your prayers, and I was specific. And, you know, maybe he didn't on earth, but that doesn't mean that he's not, he wasn't capable of it because I know that like God still is and God still can, that just for whatever reason wasn't his plan. And you know what? I don't have those answers and I may not ever get them, but I do rest in knowing one day I'm going to get to kiss those sweet cheeks again. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) If he's not up there showing out bad. I already know he is. (laughs) I took him flowers last week and I was like, I already know. You cutting up. Sorry, God, you cutting up. You asked for him. You, <laughs> you got all of them. <laughs> um, I'm I'm so grateful for you just your willingness to have this conversation with me and your willingness to allow me to share you with the world. Natoya, I love you with my whole heart. You, um, you are such a blessing. And I'm just grateful for you walking in this journey even in the most difficult times, to still continue to walk in it. So thank you, sis. You rock. Oh, thank you. I love you, you so much. You are a dope black mama. Yeah, you have my heart. I just, I, I really appreciate it. You know, all of your prayers, all of your thoughts from 2016 to now. You are that person. You, Absolutely. you're not going to forget me. And I, I truly appreciate that. Well, it's all love, sis. I love you. Love you. Thank you.